Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to this presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation is by Dr. Thomas M. Price. Dr. Price is a professor of reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Duke University. The title of his talk is Basic Molecular Techniques for Analysis of DNA and RNA. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about this presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled questions and an email address will be provided. The question period will only be open for a three week period after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will be a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. We are very excited for our talk today, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Thank you so much for attending the Grand Rounds this morning on Basic Molecular Techniques for Analysis of DNA and RNA. I have no disclosures. The learning objective includes understanding basic characteristics of RNA and DNA, comprehending the principles of nucleic acid isolation, electrophoresis, and blotting, appreciate the basis for PCR, understanding the molecular techniques used for PGS and PGD, and realizing the potential of CRISPR. As an outline, we will look at structure of RNA and DNA, isolation and quantification, DNA sequencing, southern and northern blotting, PCR, RT-PCR, real-time and digital PCR, in situ hybridization, expression microarray and RNA sequencing, CGH, array CGH, SNP array, and next generation sequencing, and last, an introduction to CRISPR. Ribonucleic acid forms the basis for both RNA and DNA, the difference being that RNA has a hydroxy group on the second carbon, whereas DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, has only a hydrogen group. The lack of this hydroxy group is thought to stabilize DNA and make it less susceptible to DNA degradation period. The each contains a base pair, which we'll talk about in a moment, coming off the first carbon. DNA is essentially only used for genetic coding and is found in the nucleus and in the mitochondria. In contrast, RNA is found in many molecules, including messenger RNA ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, and also other nuclear proteins for energy currency, such as AMP, ATP. Polymerase generates a phosphodiesterase bond, always in a 5' prime to a 3' prime direction. So you see in this diagram what's called a condensation reaction, which links the two ribose molecules, resulting in an end product of water. The base pairs that are found in RNA and DNA are as follows. You have purines, which are made up of two nitrogen-based rings, and these are adenine and guanine. And you have three pyrimidines, which are made up of a single nitrogen-based ring. These include cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Thymine is only found in DNA whereas uracil is found in RNA. Thymine is more stable than uracil, which can be converted to cytosine, which can lead to abnormal adenine to cytosine binding. The base pairs bind to each other, so thymine binds to adenine, or uracil would bind to adenine, and cytosine binds to Guanine. These have different hydrogen bonds, so only two hydrogen bonds in the A to T 
where there are three hydrogen bonds in a G to C binding. Thus, the number of GC pairs in a DNA fragment raises the melting temperature because it, ca it needs a higher temperature to melt three bonds as opposed to two. This becomes important when you're looking at PCR reactions, and we'll discuss that more down the road here. So DNA is always found in the nucleus as a right-handed helix. It binds histone proteins and then has increasing condensation going through chromosome formation. Humans have over 3 million base pairs, but only approximately 1.5% of them are used to encode protein. In contrast, mitochondrial DNA is found as double-stranded circular DNA as found in bacteria. And in fact, it's believed that the precursor of the original mitochondria was a bacteria that invaded and managed to persist in a cell. Mitochondrial DNA encodes 13 proteins, whereas there are about 1,500 nuclear encoded proteins in a mitochondria, so about far the most come from nuclear transcription, uh, but 13 basic proteins come from the mitochondrial DNA itself being transcribed. Transcription within the nucleus originally results in what's called precursor mRNA or pre-mRNA. This has also been referred to as heterogeneous nuclear RNA, although there are other types of heterogeneous nuclear RNA besides pre-mRNA. This contains a cap, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and it contains a long mRNA or pre-mRNA, which has sequence, which is going to both be turned into exons, which are going to encode for protein, and it has introns, which are going to be cleaved out before the transcript is moved into the cytoplasm. The areas that are cleaved out are called splice sites, and in general, the splice sites have a GU sequence on the 5' prime end and an AG sequence on the 3' prime end of where the splicing is going to take place. About 99% of introns obey this GU-AG rule, but there are other recognized sites which can include GC and AG and AU and AC. The nuclear or nucleoprotein that does the splicing is called a spliceosome, and spliceosomes consist of five small nuclear RNAs and about 50 to 100 proteins. The activity of a spliceosome is tissue-specific and regulated by both silencers and activators. So how a pre-mRNA is spliced is going to depend on which tissue or cell type it is in. So in the example you see here, with this spliceosome, you ended up with this mature messenger RNA, which is going to yield proteins based on these exons, whereas in a different tissue, you may have uh, different splicing and thus a different protein. So this is called alternative splicing, and this is really key to the complexity of organisms. For example, 95 to 100 percent of transcripts in humans are may undergo alternative splicing, whereas only 65 percent in the mouse. So it's not so much a huge difference in the number of genes as more it's a significant difference in how the genes are processed with subsequent alternative splicing. So let's look at the structure a little bit of the messenger RNA that comes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. First, it has a 7-methylguanosine cap. This cap regulates nuclear export. It also prevents exonuclease digestion and it assists in ribosome recognition. 
also very important, the messenger RNA contains a COSAC sequence next to the cap. The COSAC sequence is what signals the start of translation. And the COSAC sequence is fairly consistent with what you see here, GCC, RCC, AUGC. So let me go over this a little bit. When it's a small letter, not capitalized, that means it can differ. When you see a capital letter, that means it's always consistent. So an R is going to be a purine. So there's going to be either adenine or guanine in this location. The AUG, of course, is the start codon. And then the C is always consistent. So there's always going to be a cytosine after the AUG. And this COSAC sequence is going to start translation. Translation of a messenger RNA usually starts with uh, what's called a 5' prime untranslated region. So although it will it was originally transcribed, this area will not be found in the subsequent protein. The protein will be encoded by what's called the open reading frame. The stop codons will signal an end to the addition of amino acids, and they are UAA, UAG, UGA. And then last, you'll find a 3' untranslated region. Within your 3' untranslated region, there will be a sequence AAUAAA, which signals addition of a poly-A tail. And we'll talk a little bit more about the function of all these. So looking more at the 5' prime untranslated region, we talked about the COSAC sequence, which initiates translation of the open reading frame. The untranslated region often also contains what is called an upstream open reading frame. So an upstream open reading frame will actually create a additional protein called an open upper open reading frame protein. And this protein will control the translation of the main open reading frame. So usually it is a positive control. So you will have this originally translated and then subsequently this will bind downstream to another part of the 5' prime untranslated region, and this will regulate translation of the main protein. The 5' prime untranslated region also often will contain hairpin loops that bind proteins to regulate translation. So in this example, you see a hairpin loop that binds an iron regulatory protein. And the presence of this iron regulatory protein is based on how much iron is in the cell. So in, with a condition of lacking iron in the cell, you may have this iron regulatory protein binding this hairpin loop, and the hairpin loop would prevent translation of your protein. And then when the cell is abundant in iron, the iron would bind the regulatory protein, pull it away from the hairpin loop. The hairpin loop would then straighten out, and you would then resume translation of the main protein. The 3' prime untranslated region tends to be longer than the 5' prime untranslated region and has lower GC content. It also has some interesting functions. First is this is typically where microRNAs bind to repress translation. It also tends to contain what are called AU-rich elements, or AREs. These AU-rich elements bind proteins that regulate mRNA stability and will promote translation. They're called ARE binding proteins. Last, there is a poly-A binding protein, or PABP, which will bind the poly-A tail, and that will cause the transcript to circulate as the 
poly A binding protein will bind to elongation factors which are binding to the cap at the 5 prime end and the circularized messenger RNA that promotes translation. Ribosomal RNA is much more abundant and about 80 percent of RNA is ribosomal. Ribosomes are a combination of RNA and associated proteins which are of course involved in translation. Eukaryotic ribosomes are composed of a large subunit and a small subunit and they're referred to in what are called Svedberg units which is the time that it takes for the molecule to reach the bottom of a tube during centrifugation and it's based on both size and shape. So the entire ribosome is ADS, the largest component is 60S and this has a 5S RNA which is 121 base pairs, has a 5.8S which is 156 base pairs and it has a 28S which is 5070 base pairs. It also contains 46 proteins of which there are two polymerases, polymerase 1 and 3. The smaller unit is 48, 40S, it contains an 18S or 1869 base pair RNA and also 33 proteins and RNA polymerase 1. You can use ribosomal RNA subunits often for sizing and loading controls uh, when you're doing northern blots, which is shown here. So this is a blot showing 28S and 18S, and these can act as size markers. Of course, now you can easily buy size markers. Also, the abundance in general, your 28S should be about twice uh, the amount of 18S, and the smear that you see between them is going to be messenger RNA. Transfer RNA makes up about 15% of total RNA. This is a small molecule, about 75 to 90 uh, base pairs, and it's an L-shaped molecule. The 3 prime end always has an ACC sequence, and this is what binds the amino acid. There are unique enzymes called amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which binds the amino acid to a tRNA and the enzyme is specific for the amino acid. So even the initiating methionine which starts the protein has a specific enzyme compared to internal methionines. One tRNA can bind more than one codon so the sequence in the message is called a codon which is three nucleotides and the sequence which is part of the transfer RNA. It's called an anti-codon. So the anti-codon matches up to the codon and that is what indicates which amino acid will be added. So here you see we have a codon sequence of AAA which is going to recognize a UUU which is a lysine attached amino acid. And so that is how the amino acids are added during translation. There are less tRNAs than the necessary number of codons and that's because one tRNA will recognize more than one codon. That's what's referred to as the wobble effect in which the first nucleotide of the tRNA binds more than one type of nucleotide in the first position of the codon. The base pair on the tRNA which can do this is often inosine, which is represented by the I. Inosine will bind to all nucleotides. So for example, for the amino acid glycine, you can have four codons, GGU, GGC, GGA, and GGG, all of which would be recognized by one transfer RNA. So there are a minimum of 31 transfer RNAs and that which are required to recognize all 61 codon codes.
So let's turn to working with DNA and RNA. There are very basic processes in isolation of DNA and RNA. They include disruption, removing other species that you don't want, and then recovery. So disruption would include in tissue just manual with a mortal and pestle, uh, homogenization. With cells, you can look at sonication, enzyme digestion with guanidine isothiocyanate and phenol. Then removing proteins can be done with proteinase K, which is an enzyme which will degrade proteins. If you're interested in, all, in DNA, then you could remove your RNA with RNases. Then you can also use extraction methods, which we'll go over. You can use things associated with beads and columns to also remove the undesired molecules. And then there's recovery. In the case of DNA and RNA, this is uh, typically precipitated with alcohol. And then you can elude it from beads or columns. Let's look at an example. Maybe it'll make it a little bit more clear. Trizol, which is a commercial product, is commonly used to isolate RNA. So trizol contains guanidinium thiocyanate and phenol. So let's say we start with some cells, which we place in the trizol, which is red. And then by vortexing them, you get cell and nuclear membrane lysis, so disruption. Then in the presence of the guanidinium thiocyanate and phenol, it disrupts hydrogen bonding. So as we showed, the base pairs are excellent at hydrogen bonding and very soluble in water. And to be able to isolate, you have to disrupt this hydrogen bonding to get it away from the water. And agents that do that are called chaotropic agents. And this is characteristic of guanidine and thiocyanate and phenol and other agents. So this will isolate it away from the water. And then you can add chloroform, which will do an extraction. So with the chloroform, you shake it up real well, and you get distribution into three phases. You have an aqueous phase, which is going to have the RNA. You have the inner phase, which is going to have the DNA. You have the organic phase, which is going to have protein, lipids, and other macromolecules, which in general you don't want. So then you just take off the aqueous phase, put it in a new tube, add isopropanol, Isopropanol will precipitate the RNA. And you typically will wash the RNA a couple of times with 70% ethanol. And then you're going to dissolve it in TRIS EDTA buffer. So the TRIS maintains a normal pH, whereas EDTA binds magnesium. Magnesium is necessary for RNases. So if you bind your magnesium, you, inhibitate, you inhibit RNases and protect your RNA. So now that we have our nucleic acid, how do we figure out how much do we have? So you quantify it by spectrophotometry. Nucleic acids have maximum absorbance at 260 nanometers. And o a OD of 1 at 260 corresponds to 50 micrograms per mil concentration of double-stranded DNA, 40 micrograms per mil of single-stranded DNA or RNA, and 33 micrograms per mil of single-stranded oligonucleotides. Contrast, the maximal absorption of proteins is 280 nanometers. So you can look at the ratio of 260 to 280 to figure out how much contamination of your RNA there is by proteins. And this table here gives you an example. If you had 100% nucleic acid, no proteins, you'd have a ratio of 2. And if you had no nucleic acids and all protein, it'd be 0.57. Most people consider pure RNA to be a ratio of about 1.87 and RNA of 2. You can also look at a 260 to 230 ratio. So 230 nanometers is principally where phenol glycogen and DMSO absorb light. And a 260 to 230 ratio should be about 2.0 to 2.2 for a reasonably pure nucleic acid. So now you quantify it. That doesn't really tell you if it's of the integrity of the RNA. So RNA can be degraded and still show up on an OD. So to figure out if it's good RNA, there's a couple of ways. The most commonly used quick and cheap way is to just 
run out about 200 nanograms on a electrophoresis, agarose electrophoresis, which we'll talk about, and then stain it with cidium bromide. And you should have clear, sharp 28S, 18S bands, like we talked about, about a 2 to 1 ratio. Instead of cidium bromide, you can also use other commercial agents called cyber gold, cyber green, which uh, stain with a little bit better sensitivity. If you really want to get fancy, use something called an RNA bioanalyzer. This is often done when you're trying to make sure your RNA is a very good quality to use in chip assays. So in this case, the RNA is separated by electrophoresis on microchips instead of gel. And the quantity is determined by laser-induced fluorescent detection, yielding a pictorial electropharogram. So this is electropharogram over here on the left. And you see it's just showing as the bands come off the intensity. This is what good RNA would look like. This is what degraded. You can make a graphical reproduction of this. So this would be a graph of fluorescence in time. And these would be the bands coming off 28S, 18S, 5S. And from this, you can get what's called a RIN or RNA integrity number, which goes from 1 to 10. So the higher, the better. So this would be a nice R, uh, RIN number of 10. You see nice bands. This would be degraded RNA. So you see it like a RIN number of 2. You lost your 28 and 18S, and you're seeing a lot of uh, degraded RNA. So now we've isolated our RNA. We've got uh, to prove it's good RNA. What can we do with it? Well, the first thing is you need to be able to separate your nucleic acids. And this is where electrophoresis comes in. The most common electrophoresis is done with agarose. Agarose is a polysaccharide polymer derived from uh, seaweed. It's routinely used to separate DNA fragments that are larger than 50 base pairs. The degree of DNA separation is affected by the agarose percentage. So you can see down here, table of what size DNA you're trying to separate and the percentage of agarose that you would be using. All nucleic acids are negatively charged, which is very important to remember, and thus they always migrate toward the cathode or positive pole. In commercial electrophoresis, this is pretty much always denoted by red color, just like you would see on a car battery. And so negative, positive, so it's always going to migrate toward the positive. You will usually add visible dyes to your gel so you can tell how far it's migrating and you don't end up running your nucleic acids off the end of the gel and into your solution. So agarose is nice because it's non-toxic. It's inexpensive and fairly easy to work with. But you can also do electrophoresis with polyacrylamide. So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is called PAGE, and it is most typically used for proteins, but it can be used for nucleic acids. It's especially useful for short DNA fragments of less than 60 base pairs. It tends to give you better resolution than agarose. You have to denature your sample with urea uh, to linearize it if it's double-strand DNA to separate it before running it through the gel. Gels vary from 6% to 15% concentration, again, depending on what size that you're trying to separate. In the old days, uh, scientists used to make their own page gels with powder, but the acrylamide powder is neurotoxic and mutagenic. So nowadays, most people don't do that. You can buy commercial page gels, which is certainly the most common. The other advantage is the Polyacrylamide will tolerate heat, so you can do what's called a voltage transfer. And we'll talk about transfer methods in a minute. And these gels tend to run vertical as opposed to horizontal. So now you run your gel and you end up with some kind of product and you want to see if the product is what you think it is. And that gets into DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing is a very broad topic with a bunch of new techniques that I really can't cover in this talk. It can vary from something as simple as sequencing a PCR product to sequencing the entire uh, 
genome. But for years, the major technique was what's called the Sanger dye termination methodology. And I think understanding this is important. So we will go over this for sequencing DNA. You need a few things. You need what you want to sequence. So that's your DNA template, which will be right here. That's what we're trying to sequence. And you need a primer. So you know that, say you're using PCR, you know what sequence was used for PCR, so you make your primer to that. And then you need nucleotide base pairs, so A, C, G, and T. And these are labeled with a different fluor 4. They may be blue, G green, C black, T red. And within these, you also have what are called dideoxynucleotides. So dideoxynucleotides lack the hydroxy group of the number three carbon. So thus, as we learned earlier, it cannot extend since there's nothing for the phosphate to bind. So you put these in at about a one to 100 ratio. So the vast majority are normal deoxynucleotides, but for every 100, there's a one that's dideoxy. And then the last thing you need is polymerase. So you add your DNA polymerase, and it starts adding nucleotides to your template. So you add a nucleotide, and randomly you're going to add a nucleotide that is a dideoxynucleotide, and that's going to end the chain. It can't be extended any further. Then you have all these of different lengths, and in the old days you would separate these on a big gel. Uh, nowadays it's all automated. And these DNA fragments are separated by size in a liquid polymer. And the result is you come off with a picture like this, which is showing you the uh, exact sequence of what you're sequencing by the uh, color of the floor four. So let's turn to blotting. Blotting, the original, was the southern blot. Southern blot was discovered or made by Sir Edwin Southern, who was a British biologist. And back then, it was originally used for genetic fingerprinting, a lot for paternity testing. There are other blots, uh, which we'll briefly go over one of them. And there are northern and western blots, which are played off of his name. And thus, when you're writing up your science, not capitalized. There's less commonly referred to blots, or eastern blots, which are used for determining glycosylation sites on proteins. And there's a southwestern blot, which is used for identifying proteins that bind to DNA. In the southern blot, so you've isolated DNA. Of course, you can't electrophoresis anything this huge, so you got to break it up into fragments. And this is done with restriction enzymes, which come from bacteria. And they're going to break it up into smaller fragments. And then you're going to separate your fragments on agarose electrophoresis, again, running negative to positive. Then you're going to treat it with sodium hydroxide, alkaline, alkaline denatures it. So it takes your double-stranded and converts into single-stranded DNA. And then you've got to get it onto something that you can work with. The agarose gels are flimsy. If you try to handle them a lot, they're going to break. I usually drop a bunch of them on the floor as they slide out of the dish. So we need to get them into something we can handle. So we're going to transfer them to a membrane. These membranes are usually nitrocellulose or nylon. They're positively charged. This is commonly done with what's called capillary transfer. So you have your buffer down here and a uh, wick that goes next to your gel. Then right above the gel is your membrane. Then right above the membrane is blotting paper, paper dowels, and a weight to weigh it all down. So it just, by capillary action, sucks the buffer through the gel, through the membrane, and up into the paper towels, and taking the nucleic acid with it. Once you have the nucleic acid on the membrane, you want to put it there permanently. And you can do that either by cross-linking the DNA to the membrane with baking, or you can expose it to UV light. And once it's done in there, then you can use your membrane multiple times. Then for a southern, you're going to probe it with a labeled single-strand DNA. 
<clears throat> but to keep the single strand DNA from binding everything, you have to block nonspecific binding. And that's done with many substances, including salmon sperm DNA, which you can just buy, some called Denhart solution, uh, SDS, which is a detergent, and formamide. And you pre-hybridize your membrane with these chemicals. And then once you pre-hybridize it, you hybridize it with your probe that you've made. The probe can be labeled either radioactivity or it can be labeled with some type of uh, chemofluorescent agent. And you can recognize what fragments you're looking for on your membrane. So northern blotting, we'll go over quickly, looks at RNA, some of the same principles, a little bit different. You can use either total RNA or you can do messenger RNA. To convert total RNA to messenger RNA, you just run it through either a column that has poly T on it or beads that have poly T. The poly T binds to the poly A tail, uh, pulling out your messenger RNA. And then whichever you're using, you have to denature it. Although it's single-stranded, it has secondary structure, so you've got to make it linear. You denature it with heating formamide and formaldehyde. Then you're going to again run it through agarose, going negative positive, but this is special agarose has been purified so it doesn't have any RNAs in it that are going to degrade your RNA. Then again, you're typically going to uh, transfer with capillary transfer to a cationized nylon membrane, fix it to the membrane. Then you can probe it in several ways. You can use uh, phosphorus label probes. It can be a cRNA, it can be a cDNA, it can be an oligo. It's got to typically have more than 24 base pairs. You add phosphorus to it. You can either incorporate on the end or you can actually uh, do something called random prime PCR to incorporate it throughout the molecule. Or you can use chemiluminescence. So this is generally what a uh, realistic uh, northern looks like. So one from our lab that you can tell is not, not beautiful like you'll see in all the publications. This is a northern looking at different types of breast cancer cells and a novel transcript. And you see we're getting bands primarily right here and right here. You can have an RNA ladder, which you can add, which will tell you sizes. And very important in RNA is using a loading control. So you use a housekeeping gene. So you want something that you believe is going to be consistent throughout all your samples. So we believe that actin should be the same in all these breast cancer cell lines. And we run out the actin, and you can see, sure enough, they're all equal except for the DY lane. So this tells you that something happened here. Either the RNA was degraded or we didn't load the proper amount. But it tells me that the amount of transcript in the DY lane is most likely underestimated uh, compared to the others. So let's turn to PCR. PCR was originally, or let's say certainly promoted, by Kerry Mullis who won the Nobel Prize in 1993. It's a very interesting story. Uh, Dr. Mullis worked for a biotechnology company and for his hard work he received uh, a $10,000 bonus for the invention that would revolutionize molecular biology. Uh, luckily he did subsequently get a Nobel Prize which I think gives him a little bit more money than 10000 PCR is a method to copy precise segments of DNA to make large quantities. So usually when you isolate DNA, you have to start out with a very small amount, and you can use PCR to convert it to large amounts that uh, you can more easily work with. There are three parts of your standard PCR reaction, denaturation, annealing, and extension. So you can start uh, with DNA. If you're looking at RNA, so you originally are going to take your RNA and convert it to cDNA with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So you take your RNA, make it uh, cDNA, and then amplify it. Or you can start with double-stranded DNA. Denaturation separates and linearizes the molecule. 
So if you got double strand, it's going to turn into single strand, and, and it's going to linearize. You do this by heating to 94 to 96 degrees centigrade. Then you're going to anneal what are called primers. So primers are short amounts of DNA nucleotides, which you've created, and these short segments are referred to as primers, and they're going to bind specific sequence. Uh, so remember your primer is always, when you add enzyme, going to go from the 5 to the 3 prime, so that means your template is going to be the opposite direction. And then you're going to extend. Extend means you're going to add polymerase. So when you anneal, you lower the temperature down to just at the melting temperature, a little bit below of the primer, so the primer can stick. And then you're going to take the temperature up to 72 degrees, which is a reasonable temperature for the polymerase to work. And the polymerase is going to add in nucleotides, which you've added, of course, to the mixture. And according to the base pairs on your template, so you're going to add nucleotides this way, you got nucleotides going this way, and then you're going to keep repeating this. And when you repeat it, what you're going to end up with is the majority of everything is going to be a uh, double-stranded product of specific length. And to show you how powerful this is, if you started out with uh, one copy of DNA and you did 35 cycles of PCR, you would end up with 35 billion copies. Uh, so you can see it's an incredibly powerful technique. The reason this was revolutionized is the discovery of the enzyme, the polymerase, which is called TAC, although there are now many other polymerases, but the original was called TAC, and it was named that because it came from a bacteria, Thermophilus aquaticus. And this bacteria was found in hot springs. So this is a bacteria that can live at very high, close to boiling temperatures, and thus its polymerase is stable at those temperatures. And so you can add the polymerase initially, and you can go through all these repetitive cycles without having to add new polymerase as the enzyme remains stable. So let's talk about quantification. So one big purpose of PCR is to try to figure out what you originally started with. So if I want to know how much uh, DNA was in an original sample and I'm comparing samples, we would do it with real-time PCR. So real-time PCR, there are two most common ways. They're referred to as CyberGreen and TACMAN. We'll talk about them. CyberGreen is a these are commercial names. CyberGreen is a fluorescent dye. It binds to all double-stranded DNA. So the key is you must have only one PCR product. If you had more than one PCR product, then you would not be able to tell them apart because the CyberGreen is going to bind both of them. Both of them. As the cycle numbers increase, the amount of dye bound to the double stranded product increases, and when you reach the level that the fluorescent can be recognized, you can see the graph here starts to increase. So a line down here would have more starting material than a line up here, and this is referred to as your cycle threshold. So you can dictate what level you want to call your threshold, but at that point, when it exceeds that, then that is your CT value. To prove that you only got one molecule, you have to do something with CyberGreen called a melt curve. So when you're finished amplifying, you're going to take and you're going to heat your product one degree at a time, starting at 52 degrees and going up to 96 degrees. So when you hit the temperature that will melt your product, then you're going to see a sudden loss in fluorescence. So you come along here, all of a sudden you hit the right temperature, your double-stranded product separates into single-stranded products, the cyber grain falls off, your fluorescence decreases. This graph is usually converted into this graph, which is easier to interpret. So this shows you, you know, you got several compounds here, and they all have the same uh, melting point. So this tells you you've made one product, 
and uh, it's the same product according to the melting curve. Of course, you need to prove it's the same product, so you have to take it out and go back and sequence it with your Sanger technology we talked about to prove what you have amplified is truly your product. PCR is extremely sensitive, so you need a lot of controls to look for contamination. So you may have a control where you don't add any DNA, you have a control where you don't add any polymerase, um, and so forth to make sure that you're truly amplifying what you want. So real-time using TACMAN, another commercial name, is different. TACMAN uses specific product probes to enhance specificity and you can identify more than one product in one, in one assay. So the way this works is you not only have your primers, but you have a identifying probe. And this identifying probe on one end has a fluorescent molecule. It's usually something called 6-carboxyfluorescein or FAM. And on the other end of the probe, remember the probes are not real long, they may be 20 to 25 base pairs, and you have a quencher. The quencher is often tetrachlorofluorescein or called TET. So what happens is when the quencher is adjacent to the fluorescence producing chemical, it absorbs all the fluorescence so you don't see anything. So when you drop down to your annealing temperature, not only is your primer going to bind, but your probe is going to also bind. And then when you go to extension, so you have your polymerase acting, you got your nucleotides, and it starts adding nucleotides. The polymerase has a very special activity called a 5' prime exonuclease activity. So what that means is if it hits these base pairs that are bound, it's going to cleave them. And as it cleaves them, then your fluorescent molecule can float away from your quencher molecule and now you can register the fluorescence. And this is what it looks like. So again, you would have your CT value. So for instance, this represented right here would end up uh, having more of an original starting amount than this specimen uh, right here. So this could actually be one, two, three, ever how many lines are here, about six lines. You could uh, be using several different probes, uh, it's just based on the number of different fluorescence chemicals that you can uh, that you can find commercially. The latest thing in PCR is digital droplet PCR. This is uh, fairly new. Digital droplet PCR is a method for quantification without the need of standard curves or reference specimens. So in your previous, in your CyberGreen and TACMAN, you either got to be comparing uh, one specimen to you normalize it to a standard specimen, or you can make a standard curve where you add known amounts of uh, DNA that you make in the lab. Digital droplet, droplet PCR doesn't require that. So this method consists of partitioning a DNA sample into numerous separate droplets using a water oil emulsion. So you've got your tube here, and it's got all this uh, DNA in it. And then you can uh, add oil to it and then shake it vigorously. And what it will do is your DNA will fragment, and you will get uh, very small droplets of DNA. So you're converting your DNA into about 20,000 nanoliter drops. And then what you're going to do is run a Pac-Man type assay with a target probe and uh, maybe a housekeeping gene probe. So let's just say we're running a target probe and it uh, is going, we're using blue as an indicator. I don't know that there are any blue probes, but just for this picture. And then you run this through an apparatus similar to a flow cytometer. So as you run it through, it comes through one droplet at a time, and you have a device that's able to pick up the fluorescent. So as it runs through, you will see you know, this one picks up as fluorescent. This droplet didn't have a target in it, 
so it didn't attract a probe and doesn't have color and what you end up with is a graph like this so let's say we use fam which is not blue but we use fam and this is showing all the droplets that came out positive with a fam indicator and it can also recognize droplets that had no uh, indicator on it so these are the ones that were below whatever threshold you decide you're going to call positive positive. and by doing this you can take the number or the fraction of positive droplets uh, that comes through and you can predict the starting amount of your DNA target using something called a Poisson distribution uh, which I don't have the time or probably the knowledge to go through with you but this is a great method when you're highly sensitive when you're looking at very small amounts of target and is increasing in frequency of use Let's turn to in situ hybridization. So with in situ hybridization, you can localize DNA or RNA sequences within a cell or a tissue by using either regular labeled or fluorescent probe. So we've got three examples here. The top one is kind of your classic. This would be using tissue. So this is examining a uh, mouse brain. And they're looking for transcript for a calcium binding albumin gene and what you can see is they've added a radio label probe uh, and you can see that these cells along here are going to be the main ones they have very high transcript levels and uh, some transcripts in this area of the brain and essentially nothing in this area of the brain so that's kind of your classic uh, in situ hybridization of tissue in the reproductive world we've used it more um, you will recall it being used for fish which was the original method used to look at cleavage stage embryos after a blastomere biopsy so fish can be used uh, a couple of ways to locate a gene so in this you've done a metaphase spread of chromosomes and then you have a uh, gene sequence that you've labeled and then you're active with the chromosome spread and then you can identify where what chromosome what location your gene is on so that's here this would be a interphase cell so maybe a blastomere and here you've developed a probe which will paint the chromosome meaning it just recognizes multiple areas of a chromosome so this was commonly used to analyze specific chromosomes in day three blastomeres. So you, you know, you would look at the most common, like 21, maybe the sex chromosomes, and then it was done during interphase. So you could count here that whatever this target is, there were two of them uh, showing a normal number of chromosomes in that blastomere. Let's turn to array technology. So an array refers to any time you bind DNA to another DNA that's on a solid surface. And you can recognize it either with fluorophores or cumulonets that's labeled targets. So purposes and types of microarrays we're going to go over. The first is gene expression. So this is where you have oligonucleotide sequences from different genes are fixed to a chip and then you're going to probe them with cDNA reverse transcribed from messenger RNA to compare gene expression. You have comparative genomic hybridization which determines gains or losses and last you have single nucleotide polymorphisms or STIP microarrays which also determine gains and losses but can also be used to look at loss of heterozygosity, identify mutations and we'll go through all these. So gene expression microarray typically uses chips. There are over 30 companies currently offering microarray products, so way too much to discuss all these chips, but I would like to go over a couple of them which are um, quite interesting but certainly do not represent all the methods that this can be done. The first is a chip by Affymetrics. So again, this is where oligonucleotides are going to be synthesized on a solid chip surface. So the affymetric chip is a 1.2 cubic centimeter piece of quartz with over a million oligos attached. 
The oligos are typically 22 to 25 base pairs, and the specificity is increased by having multiple oligos to the same gene. So they're not just going to have one target. They're going to have lots of oligos recognizing the same gene sequence. And the oligos are put on the chip using something called a photolithography technique, which is pretty cool. So you have your quartz right here, and you have a nucleotide bound to it, so let's say TAC. Attached to that nucleotide is a blocking agent, and this blocking agent reacts to light. Over that, you create something called a mask. So the mask overlays this blocking agent. The mask is actually a physical property apparatus that prevents light from getting through. So the red's going to indicate your mask. And then you add one type of nucleotide. So here we've had uh, a guanine. And then, so then you're going to expose it to light. And when you expose it to light, of course, the mass prevents light from getting to these blocking agents, but it can get to this A. It releases the blocking agent. And so now the guanine's out in solution, can, can bind uh, to the adenine. And then what you do is you turn the light off, you remask it, you add a different base pair, and you do it all over again. And it takes about a hundred different masks uh, to make a chip. So this is the uh, affimetrix technique. In contrast, Agilent had a totally different idea, which is equally neat. <laughs> So Agilent took the approach of they increase specificity by using longer probes, but they have less probes. So the probes in Agilent chip are usually about 60 base pairs, but not as many of them. And these probes are generated use something called phosphoramidite chemistry. So a blocking agent, which is abbreviated DMT, is bound to the 5' prime hydroxy group of the uh, nucleotide. So represented here, so again, here you have your solid surface, you got your set of nucleotides, they're bound with DMT. DMT is removed with trichloroacetic acid. So you remove your DMT, and above that you have what they refer to as inkjet apparatus. So this is actually a little mechanical apparatus that's going to drop a specific base pair on top of each location. So here we have a TAC, so it's going to drop a GC and A, which have a DMT group. So you drop your GCA with the DMT group, it binds here, and then you do it all over again. So Agilent refers to this as Agilent Inkjet Superprint Technology. So an oligo occupies a space, just to give you an idea, of 25 by 25 microns on this chip and they're able to disperse nucleotides straight on something that size, which is uh, pretty neat. Next, we're going to talk about gene expression microarray. So I told you how they made the chips, and now what do you do with the chips? So in the basic approach, you isolate RNA from two different conditions, let's say a treated condition and a control. And you're going to reverse transcribe it to make cDNA. Because as we talked about, DNA is always easier to work with because it's not as degraded as easily. Then you're going to label your cDNAs, and then you're going to bind them on the chip, and then you're going to compare the label intensity. So these are usually labeled with uh, four fours um, called cyan. There's cyan three, cyan five, which are very common. We'll go over those a little bit more. So it's often displayed as a heat map. So this shows, uh, in this particular experiment, there were 43 genes that had a significant change, either being upregulated or downregulated. And this heat map, blue, shows upregulated genes and red, downregulated genes. And you can see that with whatever you treated it with compared to your control, there were a lot more upregulated genes than there were uh, downregulated genes. And then you, these are just replicates of your samples to see how similar they are. And then you can identify each one of these genes and then their software that will tell you what pathways these genes belong to. 
and from that you can start to try to figure out the physiologic relevance of the changes that you're seeing in your treated sample. Nowadays, the microarray chip for gene expression is being probably surpassed by what's called RNA-seq for RNA sequencing, also referred to as whole transcriptome shotgun sequencing. So let's go over this, uh, this technique a little bit. This is used to identify transcripts and can find start sites and can find exon intron borders. And it's also commonly used to compare transcript levels. So let's say you're doing the latter. You start with isolating your RNA. Then you, in this case, you have to enrich your RNA for messenger. So you can again do that with either a poly T column or beads, or you can take the opposite approach. You can actually use oligos to pull out ribosomal RNA, but what you want to end up with is messenger RNA. Then you need to fragment it. So you fragment your messenger RNA into about 40 to 400 base pair pieces. You can do that with an enzyme called RNAs3, or you can actually do it heating it with an excess of either magnesium or zinc. So now you got it fragmented, and now you're going to uh, change it to cDNA. So you do that with a reverse transcriptase. You can either add oligo DT primers, or you can use something called random primers. And now we're going to make our cDNA. Once we have the cDNA, now we're going to put it through PCR to add what are called sequencing primers and amplification elements. So the amplification elements are what the primers are going to react to, and you're going to amplify all this to create what's called a library. So the library is going to represent the original uh, message fragments that you have made. Then once you have your library, you're going to cleave off your amplification elements and you're going to use sequencing primers. So now your sequencing primers recognize uh, your sequencing sequence and you can sequence it both ways, both forward and backwards. Uh, forwards and reverse, I guess, is the more proper terminology. And then once you have your sequencing, you can align these sequences with uh, with known sequence within the genome. Uh, thank goodness for the Human Genome Project. And you can compare the transcript levels and it'll tell you what the gene is. So now let's turn a little bit to techniques that look for loss and gain in uh, chromosomes. And this will get a little bit into PGS and PGD. So the forerunner of all this was comparative genomic hybridization, or CGH. And how this works is that, let's say you took a sample from a tumor, sample from normal tissue, you uh, take the DNA, you're going to label it again with fluorophore, let's say cyan-3, which comes out yellow-green, cyan-5 comes out red, and then you're going to have a metaphase spread of chromosomes. And you're going to take that metaphase spread of normal chromosomes and you're going to add your label DNA uh, after you denature it and it's going to bind to these chromosomes. And then you have, uh, you look at it under a microscope or certainly nowadays you have a camera and a computerized method and it determines the fluorescence at each level of each chromosome and you can determine gains and losses. So looking at this chromosome here, you would see in this area there's a gain of DNA, and in this area here there's a loss of DNA. So that was how the original CGNH was done. It was then converted into an array to make it easier to work with. So let's look at an array for doing PGS. So in this example, the DNA is isolated from the trophectoderm cells and is fragmented, followed by whole gene amplification. So you got your patient sample, you got controls, you're going to label them with Psi uh, 3 and Psi 5 fluorophores, and then you're going to react it with a CGH slide. So for example, this CGH slide, an example from Agilent, this is what they call one by one M slide, which means on one slide, it has 1,060 MERS and other 
focus name for base pair. So 1 million 60 base pair targets. And they developed these so that it results in about a mean 2.1 kilobase probe spacing along each chromosome. So obviously with a trophectoderm biopsy, you ain't going to get uh, you know, anywhere from 8 to maybe 15 cells. So you're going to isolate the DNA, but you're going to get very little and not enough to do a chip. So you have to make more of it. So you're going to do whole genomic amplification. This will convert, uh, there's about six picograms of DNA in a cell. And you can take that and increase it up for every cell to about two to five micrograms of DNA. So you can see where you can end up with a lot of DNA to be able to work with. And you fragment the DNA. We talked about methods to do that. <clears throat> then you label with floor four, and then you're going to hybridize it to this slide, which has these 60 base pair targets. So here you see your test DNA is going to be uh, green yellow. Your reference DNA, which you know to be normal, is going to be red. Put it on your chip. Then you're going to get a printout, and it shows you all the binding. And you can see on chromosome four, you have a loss on the distal P uh, of chromosome four, indicating an abnormality. Next, we're going to go over SNP microarray. So, what's a SNP? A SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, and it to be defined as a SNP, it has to be found in greater than 1% of the population. It can be found in coding and non-coding DNA regions. On average, there's one SNP found every 300 to 800 uh, base pairs. And there are approximately 86 million SNPs in the human genome. If it's found in less than 1% of the population, it's called a single nucleotide variant, or SNV. But we're going to um, talk about SNP microarrays. So let's use an example that you want to do a PGD for sickle cell disease. So this is one technique that you may be able to use. So as we talked about, you do your trophectoderm biopsy, you isolate your DNA. You amplify your DNA, you fragment your DNA, and this time you're going to add biotin to the end of all your all your fragments. Now your chips down here. So this chip will have anywhere from 100,000 to 900,000 targets. Um, so in the interest of space, I just made three of them. So let's say there are three SNPs here. So this SNP would have this sequence. And there would be two possibilities in the population. There would be either the A or the C. Uh, this SNP right here would represent the sickle cell disease. Normal sequencing is GTG. Sickle cell is GAG. And then you got another SNP over here that's a T to G change. So you got like 100, 900,000 of these sitting on your chip. And you're going to take your DNA and you're going to hybridize it. And then they're going to bind. You're not only going to do this with your embryo, but you also do it with the father of the pregnancy, the mother of the pregnancy. So let's say the father of the pregnancy at the first SNP, which we're calling C, he was homozygous. At the second uh, SNP, he was heterozygous, A and T. And at the third chip, he was homozygous for T. So when you look at his results, you're going to see fluorescence. Obviously, on SNP1, just in one location. On SNP2, you're going to see a heterozygous, so you're going to see in two locations. And on SNP3, you're going to see in one location. Then you do the mother, and you're going to see the same reaction on the first SNP, since she's in the same genotype. Again, she's going to be heterozygous, so you're going to see the same reaction on the second SNP. And then on the third, you're going to get a different reaction. She's homozygous, but for the different nucleotide. And then you're going to do the pregnancy, and the trophectoderm cells here, uh, again, since mother and daddy on the first SNP are homozygous, and the pregnancy is going to be homozygous, the mom and daddy are heterozygous for the second SNP, which is the one called the sickle cell. You can tell the pregnancy is homozygous for the abnormal SNP, so this would be an affected pregnancy with sickle cell.
And then third, you're going to see uh, a heterozygous response, which you expect the father was homozygous for T and the mother was homozygous for G. So when you take and use hundreds of thousands of these SNPs, you're essentially getting a genotyping of both the mother and the father and the pregnancy. And this can be used to look for mutations for PGD. Let's next look at next gene sequencing for PGS. So one, again, there are many companies that do this, but we're going to look at Illumina. So in this technique of next generation sequencing, again, we're going to look at doing PGS this time. So you take your trophectoderm cells, you know, isolate your DNA. So then they do something novel. And instead of fragmenting, it's called tagmentation, which is very interesting. So they have these proteins called TN5 transposons. TN5 transposons were discovered in bacteria, like a lot of the proteins that we use. And in the bacteria, it has the function of cleaving DNA and relocating it to another segment of the genome in a bacteria. So we use this for next generation sequencing. You add these transposon proteins, and a transposon randomly cleaves a three prime in and adds an adapter uh, molecule, which is uh, it, you can make the adapter molecule, and it will add it. So you see here on this, remember always five prime on this side, three prime on this side is going to cleave it, and on the three prime in, add an adapter. On the other strand, again, going this way, you get five prime over here, three prime over here is going to cleave it and add a different adapter in the three prime. Then you can use these adapter sequences to PCR. So when you PCR based on these, you can add all sorts of things. You can add sequencing. Uh, so this is your adapter, a, uh, yellow and blue. You can make your primers so you add both sequencing sequence and indexing primers. So you can actually do a round of amplification, and then later you can group these by the indexing sequence. Then you're going to react these onto the solid surface, which is called a flow cell. So on the flow cell, they have permanently attached the sequencing primer sequence. So as you saw, that was a that was green and black. So all throughout the flow cell, they've attached these green and black primers. So you attach your or you put on your DNA that you made. So it's going to go down and it's going to bind to the attached complementary sequence. And then you're going to add your polymerase. And when you add your polymerase, you're going to make obviously complementary. Uh, linear structure. And then, since the, your, your original template is not attached to the flow cell, when you denature, that's going to fall off your flow cell. And so you still have this attached by the uh, primer attached to the solid surface. Well, DNA can bend, so it will find the complementary sequence to the other end primer and it'll bend over there. And then your polymerase also doesn't care whether it's bent. So you add in your polymerase again and you're going to make a complementary sequence. This is called bridge amplification. And you're of course not doing this once, you're doing this many, many times uh, to increase greatly your number of product. And then when your flow cell is done, you amplify and all the all the primers you put on it are full. Then you can take and cleave one of your primers. So let's say the black one attached here to the cell. Within it, we put a sequence that can be cleaved by an enzyme. So we add the enzyme, we cleave that, and we go to now linear uh, targets again, stuck to the flow cell. Now we're going to do something called sequencing by synthesis. So with sequencing by synthesis, you're going to add your A, T, G, and Cs, and again, each one of them has a color associated, and it has something called a reversible terminator. And remember, we talked a little bit about that 
when we were making these chips earlier on. So once you do that, it attaches uh, based on the complementary nucleotide. And then you just read the color, and you can tell what that nucleotide is. Uh, and then you can get rid of the terminator. Uh, we showed an example earlier of either acid treatment or light treatment. And when you get rid of the terminator, then you can do it, add another group, and do it again. So you're actually reading the sequence every time you add a nucleotide, which is different than the Sanger technique that we showed. So what you end up with, you have all these sequence fragments. You can group them based on your index primer, if you like, and then you uh, can align them with known chromosome sequence. And uh, that is one technique currently being used for uh, PGS, by, originally developed by Illumina. OK, we're about done. I'm going to tell you a little bit about CRISPR. Since this is something you will definitely be hearing more about in the future, I would think. So a teaser about CRISPR. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now you see why we say CRISPR. So CRISPR was again identified in bacteria, and it is a acquired immunity method to destroy viral uh, infections. So, of course, viruses love to invade bacteria, so they have to have a way to kill the virus, and this is how it was originally found. So then the bacteria, you have a genomic sequence called CRISPR locus, and it consists of DNA that will encode a, a uh, CRISPR protein. CRISPR protein is called a CAS, which is CRISPR-associated system gene, which gives you a Cas protein. And then it has what's called a leader sequence. It has palindromic sequence. And then it will have viral sequence. So what happens, a virus comes in, the bacteria sees that, and it will uh, incorporate parts of that virus DNA into its own genome so that it can recognize it. Then what it does is, and that's done by two proteins called Cas1 and 2. Then what happens is now it has a memory for that virus. So next time it sees that virus, it initiates transcription and translation. And with transcription translation, you're going to end up with a, again, a Cas protein. This one, one of the more common ones called Cas9, although there are many others. And you're going to end up with RNA, which is complementary to this viral DNA, along with the leader sequence. And this binds your Cas protein. So your end product, you got a protein, and you got uh, nucleotides bound to the protein, and this nucleotide contains viral sequence. Then this goes out into the cytoplasm, and um, so you see your Cas9, and it's going to recognize all the viral DNA that's sitting out there, and it's going to fragment it and chew it up. So hopefully the bacteria can destroy the virus and not die. So how can we take this and use it in molecular biology? Well, this is really neat. I'm going to briefly summarize a paper that was published in Nature in 2016. And what they wanted to look at was the ability to correct sickle cell gene defect in hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cells. So although the technique is certainly very difficult, the idea is actually very simple. So what they did is you can make Cas9 proteins, and then you have something called an sgRNA, which stands for a single guide RNA. So you can construct these. So the single guide RNA, you make that sequence. So it will go and recognize where your mutation is within the genome. So we talked about sickle cell a little bit earlier about the mutation. It's you know often it's a single nucleotide 
mutation. So you make your sgRNA so it will recognize that sequence in the genome, not just the single nucleotide, but the regions around it. And then you're going to also make single-stranded oligo-DNA or SSODNs. So this is what you want to replace the mutation with. So this is going to be a DNA fragment, single-strand DNA fragment that has corrected the point mutation. Then you take and you isolate your hematic stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, and you can simply put these in by electroporation. So just by electric shock, which will temporarily permeabilize your plasma membrane, these two will pop into the cell. Okay? And then your Cas9 and your single guide RNA goes to the areas of the mutation. It excises the DNA strand. So it's taken out the abnormal piece of DNA, and you got all this normal DNA that you put in there with the single-stranded ODNs floating around, and then the cell does the work itself by what's called an endogenous homology-directed repair HDR. So if HDR, the cell is going to take and incorporate the normal DNA single-stranded into the genome. Why did they do it in stem cells, so it will be maintained in the progeny, okay? And they actually took these cells, and then they could uh, put these cells into a sickle mouse, so all the mouse made was uh, sickle hemoglobin, put these cells into this mouse, and uh, start to, the cells would, you know, grow and start making progenitor cells, and they could analyze the mouse and sure enough show that normal hemoglobin was being made. So this is a good example of using CRISPR to correct uh, gene defects. Well, I appreciate your attention. I know this has been a long lecture. I hope it has uh, been helpful, and I want to thank you very much for your attention. Have a good day.